Welcome to City Cinematheque, where the art and pleasure of the movies are the subject of serious discussion. I'm your host, Jerry Carlson, and I teach film studies at the City College of the City University of New York. Today, it's our pleasure to present the 1977 Russian film, An Unfinished Piece for Player Piano, directed by Nikita Mikhailkov. Now, this is based upon Chekhov's early play, Platonov, uh, and it gathers a group of people at a country home and shows us exactly who they are over the course of their activities. We'll be talking about that, the process of adaptation, and other things after today's screening. Joining us will be Professor Emil Dreitzer from Hunter College, a noted expert on Russian literature and cinema. Now, enjoy this opportunity to see an unfinished piece for player piano. Welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed this opportunity to see an unfinished piece for player piano from 1977, directed by Nikita Mikhailkov, who goes on to win an Academy Award for his film Burnt by the Sun a number of years uh, later. This is a very rich film. It's one of the most admired adaptations of Chekhov and one of the most admired films from the period in which it was made, the Soviet Union in the 1970s. Here to chat with us about that today is one of my colleagues from the CUNY system, Professor Emil Dreitzer of Hunter College. Uh, Emil teaches, not surprisingly, uh, Russian literature and film and culture uh, at Hunter College. He's the author of 13 books, and I'll just mention uh, three of the, uh, of the 13. Uh, I like the title, Emil, Taking Penguins to the Movies, uh, <laughs> which is your book on the sociology of Russian humor. And uh, most recently, you've published uh, Shush, Growing Up Jewish Under Stalin, uh, and also Stalin's Romeo Spy, which is a spy story, uh, but based on um, somebody who really was a Romeo, uh, Romeo spy. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And this is a film that you, uh, you've told me you teach with great uh, frequency. Let me just start with that. Why do you choose, when you're teaching a course, to teach this film? Why is it an important film for you to have people see? I have to say that this film, probably the, the film, the only film that explains what happened in Russia in 1917, the film that shows some very deep-seated problems of Russian society that eventually did not did not allow it to evolve into normal democratic society. Right. Because the film takes place, the time of the action in the film right. is end of 19th century, very important. Why? Because it's already the government abolished serfdom. Seemingly there, is, there are opportunities for the Russian society to evolve right. from the serfdom from the relationship of the masters and serfs into a normal society in which every member of the society has a sense of duty, has its place, right. and so on. Now, but what happened in the film? In the film we see all this bunch of characters primarily idle. Absolutely. They, the lawyer is comfortable enough, the son of right. the uh, Sofia Petrovna, and he, he, he says, why, why you have to practice law? I'm, I'm okay, I'm comfortable. Right. The doctor has a degree from medical institute, but he is not, doesn't care to go to save a patient. He's too bored with it. He's, he's disgusted with all of this. So there's no sense that in a civil society, you have certain duties. Right. As the Platon of the hero says, you took somebody's place in the university. You finished it, you got a diploma, so you have to do something out of it. This sense of kind of a, you have, you're part of the civic society. It's not there. Ab no, it's not there. Absent. And we're talking about already generation past from 1861, this right. abolition of serfdom, to roughly we're talking about 1885 and 1890. Plenty of time to this happen. It does not happen. So he tries to, uh, Chekhov in his play, right. and the director correspondingly reflecting the Soviet time when he made it, but we'll, yeah. we'll talk a little we'll bit about, about that this. later, yeah. He shows why, what is beyond that. And so th this is the hero, the hero Platonov. Actually, he's no better than the rest of them, right. but he understands it. 
Ah, there's the difference. That's, that's the only difference. He understands it and he attacks everyone. He mocks. He's ironic because he's full of this self-disgust. He understands that he's fail a failure. And here is probably, for me at least, I try to get to the bottom of it. Why? Why all this happened? Not because of the, it was still a uh, monarchy. Right. It's not that. We, we had monarchy in other uh, uh, countries of Europe. No, because at the core of Russian culture lies the spirit of Orthodox Christianity, ah. in which contemplation of the God's design is the key to understand the Russian call it the smysl zhizni, I mean the sense of life. What is the sense of life? Not that the sense that life is as you do it. But as you <laughs> contemplate it. As you contemplate it. Right. If you contemplate only, why do anything? <laughs> so of course it's subconscious. Or of course it's, it's in every bit of uh, literature uh, in Russia. All this, that's why all these right. questions, what is the meaning of life? So that's okay. what it is. And therefore, when I show this, this film in, for my students, then later on I show another film that takes place uh, right at the, um, um, uh, at the kind of break of, uh, at the beginning of 20th century, right. uh, kind of pre-revolutionary time, literally a few years before revolution breaks out, 1905. And the, the film, I think it's a cl modern classic in my view. I, I show it. Very unusual, done in the style of retro as a, you know, kind of silent right. movies, although it is not silent. Uh, it's called by Of Men and Freaks. Okay. Beautiful, wonderful. Uh, and that ex kind of uh, shows this kind of a discord of the relationship between upper classes and lower classes. Absolutely. Farther down, we're talking about another 15, uh, 20 years. Again, nothing changes. You see, so for me, that's why the, the unfinished piece, Mechanical Piano, is the perfect example of what is, was wrong in the Russian society of the time, why it never was able to overcome this kind of, a, the inability to move on, ability to make something out of freedoms that were Absolutely. given. Absolutely. So. Absolutely the case. You know, you, you've, you've made me think of, of an analogy uh, with something oh, pe many people are familiar with in, in uh, our own national literature of the, of the United States, and that's the so-called exceptionalism of, of the literature that comes from the American South, and whether that be the plays of Tennessee Williams or whether that be the novels of William of Faulkner, yeah. there is this analogy between the plantation societies of the Americas and their master-servant relationships and exactly this kind of agrarian economy that we see portrayed in this film in which you can generate enough income through all the land that you own and right. whether they're officially serfs or whether they're, you know, underemployed uh, field labor you can get your education, you can, you know, be civilized in that way, but there's the, there's the safety net of the system and then the excuse that you're of a certain class that should be contemplating things as opposed to doing things. Uh, and that it, it comes as a, uh, uh, a, a, a natural inheritance simply by birth in, uh, in this. So I, I think those are... If, you, if people are thinking about, you know, some of the plays of Tennessee Williams or, or whatever, it's, it's but, the talk. But Oblomov, the, you, no. when we oh. say, the Oblomov, that's why the first movie that I show in my class is Oblomov. Okay. Here we have uh, Russia before the abolition of serfdom. Right. And this comfortable life of Oblomov who doesn't have to move a finger. He has everything, you know, what he needs. He's a nice man. He, I even asked some of my students a provocative question. Would you marry Oblomov? <laughs> 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 but you might be surprised. But some uh, women said, yes. Why? Because he's such a nice man. He's a good man. He has good heart and everything. He's not like your bloodthirsty exploiter. He doesn't move it. But in the same token, right. the movie and the novel on which it's based shows that he was doomed. Because actually he, heart, he dies of uh, overeating, basically. Right, or right. Yeah, abs and so. Abs yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, let's, uh, coming back to this particular film, what do you make of, this is a wonderful ensemble piece. I mean, there's mm -hmm. extraordinary mm -hmm. acting mm -hmm. on every side. Mm -hmm. on, uh, on the way Mikhail Kham chooses this house in this kind of, uh, kind of setting. What is that? 
Well, this setting is perfect for this because remember, when it opens up, number one, the day is, is hot, mm -hmm. it's humid, there is no move of fresh air. Correct. Right? There is a pond which is overgrown with scum. Absolutely. The swamp-like existence, you see the symbology on every level in this film. Absolutely. Swamp-like existence, everything is kind of a, there is no move. The, the, the idle talk in the beginning that they have and so on, like nothing moves, there is no action. Right. Pretty much like in the Russian society <laughs> at large. Yeah. So that's, that's why I think that it was a perfect setting. I have to say that the artistry in this movie is superb. I, I don't think anything that I saw done by Mikhalkov actually is better than that. Right. He's at his prime, I think, in my, in my view. Now, this is, this is interesting because this is, you know, almost 15 years before the, uh, the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. This is the, 19, the 1970s. So why make this film about this period, you know, 75 years earlier, 70 over 80 years earlier, why make this in the 1970s? And how do you get a film like this approved and made in the 1970s? That's a very good question because at that time we saw quite a bit of adaptation of classics. There's one very simple explanation. When you present a script and it's adaptation of a classic work, you have less censorship. Oh, Chekhov, of course. I mean, what, Tolstoy, fine. You know, there's right. no, no big deal. So one, one reason for that, and we saw all, not only in the movies, also in the theater, uh, resurrection of the old uh, classics, but of course giving them contemporary reading. And of right. course, when you see the parallels are striking, because when we think of Brezhnev period, this is 1977, this exactly. is the height of Brezhnev period, the period of stagnation, as we know. Mm. Is what a perfect portrait of stagnant society and ox almost saying, hey, we have, we already, what, 80 years down the road or more, 90 years, nothing changed. Right, right. The inability, we, we say beautiful words, right? The old, remember the, the, the characters, uh, uh, the, the son of, of uh, Sophia, the, the lawyer who uh, doesn't uh, practice law, right. and all other characters say, wonderful, we'll want to hold people, but they do nothing. They right. do nothing. The, the, a lot of talk, empty talk, right. but no action. Well, you know what, you know what I always uh, like to refer to films like this that, that could certainly come from Russia in this period, but come from a number of nations where there are state film industries or m issues of censorship, is that <coughs> this is what I would call a deniable allegory because it, it, it's doubly coded like all allegories so that the audience knows they're looking at Chekhov, knows there's an analysis of pre-revolutionary late 19th century, but they're equally aware of the fact that this is about today. But if anyone is confronted with that in terms of official interpretation, it's completely deniable. What do you mean? Oh no! Our glorious country is nothing like uh, this. While at the same time, you're exerting exactly it's like this, but it, but it is but it is um, ac acceptably deniable, and that and so you remain protected uh, by doing it Absolutely. in that way. Well, the, something that the few very few people who didn't live in the Soviet Union, like I lived for half of my life, don't realize that the censorship of Soviet time is unprecedented in Russian history. Even at Tsarist time, there right. was no such severe censorship. So therefore, the artist had to find other ways, and right. that's we, as I understand, gives the poetic license to, or should I say, impetus to look for some other means of talking about right. the ills of the society without being basically slaughtered by, <laughs> by censorship. <laughs> so that's why the adaptation of that period of the 70s is especially fruitful by adaptation. Right, and this is very interesting because this is a, a, a play of Chekhov's, it's an early work that was not actually produced during yeah, his yeah, lifetime. Yeah. So there's the way in which it's an unproduced and unfinished piece. So you're on the one hand going back to a classic author who's you know, perfectly accept, you know, acceptable because there's an interpretation of Chekhov that's an official interpretation right. of him as someone who brings the news about the decadence of the society that must be and, swept away. And, and ideologically, it does, not, it, it does not contradict the Soviet stand that actually the Russian society, the Russian intelligentsia of the time did not know what to, how to move society forward, therefore the 
right. revolutionaries came in and, and made the movie, so to speak. <laughs> Needless to say, we know what is the result of it, exactly because the society that uh, at the time of uh, around 1917 was completely disintegrated in that sense. And, and the, sen the sense of social injustice was so acute that it was enough just one spark that everything and was... Yeah, exactly. and, and people should remember that uh, uh, while there was this great, uh, retrospectively, <coughs> there was this uh, great myth uh, created by the Bolsheviks about, about themselves, they were actually a minority party that took advantage of the situation. And if you look at the statistics, there were really very <laughs> few of them. And of course, it, it, you know, it eventuated in civil war, uh, but it also meant that part of their bringing things under control, they had to exert with the, with the brutality that they used because there were so few of them. You had to simply kill the other people because there was too many of, um, uh, uh, of them. Well, the, the other advantage, just to get back to uh, the, the source material here, is also there are, you know, there are very uh, admired adaptations of the, uh, the, the, the classic repertoire of the Chekhov plays, but if you're doing that classic repertoire of the Chekhov plays, you're then restricted by, in a certain sense, the classic status of it. Whereas here, Mikhailkov really had the, the freedom as it were, to take the core materials here, but they're not in that final gelled shape that the Three Sisters More, is. Moreover, not. because the play was never uh, produced in, in Chekhov's time, and uh, later on, right. even until 1926, it was, I believe, not published even, you know, uh, yeah, uh, as cool. such. So therefore, he had a license, I say, in other words, it was not simply adaptation. He called it adaptation, but in fact, it was yeah. recreation <laughs> of a new work based on having the name of Chekhov, of course, everything is Chekhovian, there is a lot of Chekhovian teams right. there, the, uh, we, we see the same, uh, uh, I would say that the, the, in the Cherry Orchard, we hear the same kind of a, a problem uh, between the Chekhovian kind of love for the beauty of the orchard, of the old, right, right. of the aristocratic way of life, and at the same time, and this kind of a He's laughing at this inability to live normal life uh, of these uh, people. But in this play, he has, which was written before that, right. uh, his sympathies are much better, much more on the side of the working man, the one who actually, uh, he is the one who is creditor, this right. Gerasim Kuzmich. He says, everything what you have seen here, it's mine. I, I produced on my money. I gave you money. Absolutely. I'm the doer. I can do everything. Do, do. You see, that's the, that's the key. Because yeah. all other, they do nothing. They cannot do anything. They are not interested. No, and it's very interesting the way he uh, sets this up in terms of exposition. Because we see, and, and this is the, you know, the paradox of the moving picture about people who don't move. Okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <yeah. laughs> and that, but the, the basis of how this society is now being driven and fueled by this money, by this the upstart, the person who is the nouveau riche right. uh, of this, that's not revealed until later. Exactly. You know, because he's, uh, he's in his place there, and then finally, since there's nothing recognized, he has to, because they're never going to recognize it, they're never going to give him that praise, so he has to step forward and assert himself and praise himself. But there's a symbology there because this is the man who eventually will marry this uh, woman mm. because, you know, that's, that's the whole thing. So the, the beauty of the aristocracy, so she's a beautiful woman, and so, so there is a, even, I would say, the, the symbology of having, of having uh, uh, illicit affair right. uh, with her. That's what it is. Russian aristocracy has illicit affair with the new class that is coming. Be why? Because she cannot serve her otherwise. Uh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Now, you, 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 by introducing that, you introduce this uh, other thing we haven't talked about, and that has to do not just with classes, but it has very much to do with gender roles and uh, and 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 women. The way in which this is a hierarchical so society that we have a character who's yearning for modernity, and we have the, the whole way it's thematicized. Well, we don't deal with things that way in our household because we're sensitive right. to, to, to gender matters. And, and gender becomes this sort of site 
this place for a big debate about the traditional society versus a modern, an open, a democratic society. Well, de definitely women in, in this check of play are powerless. Yeah. They all depend on men. How men, uh, you know, the, the, the Gerasim gives money for the uh, for this uh, for running the the estate, and uh, the girl who was Sophia, who is in love with Platonov, she's also she leaves, but she never she expects him to come to uh, Saint Petersburg for her to search for her. Why didn't you look for me, oh, yeah. and so on? So. Uh, it, it's no, no. Uh, obviously, it's no, no place for a woman in that society to take charge of her own life. Right, right. There's no but, opportunity. But, but you have, you, you have. Uh, while all the action takes place here, and, and you, you've given us such a, I think, shrewd analysis of this is this swamp-like setting, the stasis, the hidden chambers uh, uh, of the house. There is this interesting co reference to these moments in Saint Petersburg that Platonov and his girlfriend of that moment had. And of course, St. Petersburg is famously the port city, the, the city built to bring right. the West into, yeah. uh, into Russia. And so there's this sense that they've gone out there, they've tasted as close as you can have in Russia of your day to being Western and all of those things. And then they retire into the, the, the society because uh, either you have to stay in St. Petersburg or you must emigrate. Right. Uh, right. But then when, you, when you're pulled back in here, then you're pulled back into the society represented by this, this Dasha and, you know, the, the man who can run over and kiss her hand right. and, 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 and say, well, you know, that didn't hurt so much. Right, now, right, now, right, now right, 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 right. Well, it, that's a good... Uh, uh, it's a, it's a, you, you, you notice something that is explored to much more a stronger degree in the next mo movie that I told you about. I hope we may, we may bring it on mm -hmm. this idea about men, uh, freaks and men. Freaks and men. Okay. Then it's then it's from Saint Petersburg. There's one step farther because oh, okay. it's a, from Saint Petersburg. The, the main character, a woman, by the way, travels to the West, which is in the movie is sort of. Uh, kind of like magic realism. She just crosses the border. We don't know exactly what it is, but it's the West. Right. Doesn't matter what kind of it. And it's exactly the same. And she doesn't find anything there. She she's disappointed. She find, doesn't find anything that would be different from life there. So it's not mm -hmm. that you go there where everything right. happens. It's that you have to be there. Right. <laughs> that's that's explored perfectly in, the, in that movie. So in in the, the that's why I show first this un, unfinished piece because unfinished piece sets out almost like a stage for the next move. What's next? Right. And the Russian intelligentsia tries to move sort of um, physically a little right. bit into venture into the West, but it's not ready because of it's again expecting that somebody else will do for them something. Right, absolutely. Yeah. Now, so what do you make? We, you know, Chekhov is frequently, um, we're told uh, that he writes comedies, though many of the adaptations don't really um, emphasize that aspect of, of his great art. What do you make of the main servant and how he fits into this on, 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 on ensemble? Well, all both servants, I have to say, they're brought in perfectly to show that this is very few. I even have to tell my students, remind them, this is the time they were they are not serfs. Right. They are hired. Right. So in other words, at least some modicum of of civility and respect should be shown to them. Right. They can say goodbye and go. But the truth of the matter is that the relationship toward between upper classes and lower classes remained the same. The way that, that um, uh, uh, Anna Petrovna, they, no. they, she treats them, uh, giving all kind of you know uh, courses and uh, go away from me. No, 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 no. It shows that nothing really changed. They they are in the same position. Well, and, and what's interesting is not only her mistreatment of them, but the way in which this is, you know, a symbiotic relationship that, has, that is centuries old. And so it's not the fact that you can wave a magic wand over serfs and all of a sudden they instantly become uh, well-educated, 
um, people with a very strong self-image of them of themselves. So it's difficult to pull away from that if if that master-servant relationship is all that you've had to um, uh, define yourself. There's a wonderful moment in one of the plays of uh, uh, Horton Foote, who is frequently referred to as the Anton Chekhov of Texas, uh -huh. a, 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 a great, a great, yeah. in which there's a, a a black man on a plantation, but it's at the turn of the century, and the young boy asks him, "Well, you were freed when you were a young, uh, when you were a young man?" And he said, "Yes, I was." And he says, "Well, why didn't you leave?" And he says, "Well, to go where?" Exactly. Because the you know the imagine the imaginary boundaries are drawn so strongly by the relationship that the legal document doesn't really change. The same uh, happened in Russian society. Absolutely, they they had nowhere to go. At best, they could join uh, the lumpen proletarian and you know people living on you know in awful conditions working in factories and right. and, and even do so they had to ask permission from the local community, the peasant community. In other words, they were not free in full spirit of it, oh, in full okay. sense of it. So right. therefore, even to choose whoever they will be servants of, I mean, this kind of paid right. servants, that also there was not much of a choice for them. Right, right. You know, in the reality of life that they lived in. So. You don't go to the bus station and say, exactly. take, me to, take me to L.A. <laughs> exactly. As a day laborer, right? <laughs> yeah, abso a a yeah. Ab abs absolutely the, yeah. absolutely the, yeah. the, the, the case. Yeah. So we've just got like one minute uh, uh, left. So if there's, if there's anything you'd like to leave people with about this, uh, uh, about this film, anything that you, you know, a, a kind of last word uh, to open up some doors for them. Um, probably for even for contemporary American um, readers and I mean uh, audience right. uh, viewers, the character of Mikhail Platonov is very indicative of that kind of a, a man of who had great hopes for himself. He was called the young Byron. Yes, he wanted to do achieve something in his life, and but it was the lesson of his life, and actually he says it that why he didn't achieve anything, why he didn't even finish university, mm -hmm. because he believed there is always tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if anything that Chekhov wants to say is there is no such a thing as tomorrow. There is a thing now. Okay, I'm going to have to stop <laughs> you now because we've run out of time. <laughs> if you'd like more information about City Cinema Tech or about CUNY TV, there's a way to get it. No surprise, visit the internet please visit www.cuny.tv. You'll find click-ons there about our programming, and also you can communicate with us by email. So please visit www.cuny.tv. Emil, thank you for a very fast, lively, and insightful 30 minutes. Pleasure having you here, and I hope you'll be joining us again sometime. Thank you. Thank Great. You. And thank you for joining us here on City Cinema Tech today, and I hope you uh, come back as we stroll through the archives of film history. In any case, thanks for joining us today. Bye-bye for now.